ounce of turkey breast. That's all the protein you need for the whole day. Mm. So, and you know, most people they sit down and they have meat, they're usually eating four or six ounces, maybe twice a day. Um, and you can get 30 grams of protein and all you eat is broccoli. Um, you know, the, uh, if you look at food not based on uh, volume, but based on calories, and you decide, I need 2,000 calories a day to maintain. Well, if you eat 2,000 calories a hamburger, or you eat 2,000 calories worth of broccoli, you're getting the same amount of protein. 2, 000, but 2,000 calories of broccoli might be five pounds of broccoli. So you got to, you know, I want to eat five <laughs> pounds of broccoli. <laughs> but, but I'm just saying, you know, there's no shortage of protein. Every food has protein, including vegetables other than lettuce. Yeah. Yeah, doesn't it um, a lot depend on your background? And some people need more protein than others. And someone explained to me one time about the whole controversy with vegetarianism versus meat eating. And what, what this person said made a lot of sense. He said, you know, you take an Eskimo, eating a traditional Eskimo, Eskimo diet, you take someone from India eating a traditional vegetarian diet, and you switch diets on them, you're going to have two very sick people. Mm -hmm. Now, you can do that slowly over a month, but neither one of them will ever be quite right because of their background. Now, if, you, if you're if you want to figure out what a giraffe eats, that's easy because they're only located in one place in the world. Mm -hmm. But the so, thing, let me, I'm just going to stop you there. Yeah. Um, and the reason is because what we're going to get to in the next part is that you can debate theory all day long. Yeah. What's really important is what do you need? Yeah. And you can do that. You can decide that based upon if I eat this way, I feel good. If I eat this way over here, I don't feel good. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if somebody in India starts eating seal blubber, for 80% of their calories. If they can um, even get it. If they can even get it, yeah. Um, you know, they might not do so well. They might, they might not. But the point is, they would know pretty quickly that this is not a good diet for me. Yeah. So, and, and that, um, and I'm just going to encourage, when I, the reason I stop you is I just want to encourage everyone here to not get embroiled in the debate about the best diet from your head. Yeah, yeah. You need to choose a way to eat decide that it's either working for me or it's not. And if it's not working for you, do it differently. Because these things, you know, when we talk about um, food sensitivities, it, it, isn't, it isn't subtle. It usually isn't subtle. If you have a food that your body doesn't like and you decide, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to play around. I'm just going to give this up for a while and see how I do. If it's a problem for you, it's apparent. It is obvious. You're not scratching your head wondering whether you made the right choice. You're going, whoa. And if you're not clear, you know, you give up, and you need to give things up for about six or eight weeks, but if you're not clear, the, it's often in the going back onto it again, and it makes you sick, and you go, oh, yeah, I guess I was, I'm reacting more to this than I want to believe. Um, so, so we're going to stay with what we can embody and not what we can mm -hmm. think and read. Right. Mm -hmm. so, but I just wanted to say, just, so this is about the, uh, uh, the antibodies, but... If we're talking celiac disease, I want to come back to that. So celiac disease, um, you know, if this is just a cross section of your small intestine, and you've got the, the lining of the intestine, the villi, and on the top here I'll draw, you know, the villi that line the small intestine tend to be, you know, these little fingers of stuff that give a lot of surface area and allow absorption of food. But if you have inflammation, if you have celiac disease and you're eating wheat, then these get just kind of really, you know, they can, they can do a biopsy of your small intestine and they can say, oh, this, under the microscope, this is the change in the mucosa that looks like celiac disease. Um, but also, as these villi, this lining, as it gets destroyed because of the inflammation, <coughs> these cells that are dying release things into the blood and you can find proteins that are associated with those villi in the blood. So you can say, oh, there's destruction of the lining of the small bowel going on in this person. We can even see it in their blood. So these are some of the tests that are done, you know, the biopsies, the blood tests. These are the tests that are done to diagnose celiac disease. But there's a whole, um, it was a couple of years ago, there was a big worldwide conference because what was becoming clear was that there was um, a lot of people who found that their health improved dramatically when they gave up gluten. But they had all of the lab testing was normal. So the doctor's going, you can't be having a reaction to gluten, your lab testing is normal. <laughs> and so what they came up with was this 
diagnosis called NCGS, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, uh -huh. NCGS, meaning you have, uh, so, and I know it sounds a little comical, but it, it kind of gave the official recognition that there are people who have real health benefits. But just going back to, the, we kind of started with, you were saying, well, maybe you shouldn't give it up entirely. Um, there's been a lot of research. If you're having an inflammatory reaction to a food, and a lot of this comes from research with gluten, um, all you need to eat is a tiny little bit every six weeks to keep the fires alive. And what do those mm -hmm. fires do if you don't have celiac disease? They, you keep losing cartilage in your knees, you keep losing cartilage in your hips, you age faster, you develop degenerative diseases. And so that, um, you know, at the basis of most disease is inflammation. And at the basis of that inflammation for a lot of people is the foods they eat. And so uh, you don't want to go halfway with this. You might as well not even bother. Um, and, I, and I say that also, just there are a lot of people where, um, I'm convinced that you know they, people come to me because they're having some problem or another. And I'm convinced that food's not the cause, but food is something that if I can work with them and engage them and get them to really eliminate some of these foods and at least try it, then they'll be hooked. They will see the benefits, but it's gotta be 100%, and that's the hard part. Yeah. You know, people will, you know, I, they come back, you know, I see them in 30 days or 60 days, and well, how are you doing with the eating things? Oh, I'm pretty good. And you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to hear yeah. pretty good. I want to hear, I'm doing great. I haven't had any. You know, yeah, just a little bit. Uh, it's like, well, you know, we really, and then nothing's changed. You know, they're still, yeah. maybe they're a little bit better, but they're still, all the complaints they came in originally are all still there. And, and so, you know, we really, you know, got to, and so working with people and getting them to go that distance where they at mm -hmm. least give it six or eight weeks, they come back and they go, oh, you're right. You know, and, um, and I've had, really surprising things, especially the autoimmune things. You know, I've got a guy right now that I'm seeing that has a, a really horrible kind of autoimmune problem with his lungs. I mean, he, you know, just was, couldn't walk across the room without hauling an oxygen tank behind him. And he's a young guy. Um, and, you know, when he, and he was, they were talking about putting him on really, you know, when, when you want to, the drugs that kill the immune system are usually chemotherapy drugs. So, yeah, you know, the yeah. one side effect of chemotherapy drugs is they kill your immune system, but if you want to kill the immune system, that's the drugs you go to. You use methotrexate and some of these other drugs that are derivative of that. And, you know, that's what they were saying. You know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get this immune problem under control. And he was, you know, you read, you read the product inserts for these things and what are the complications of it um, could cause cancer and early death. <laughs> Um, you know, side effects. Side effects. <laughs> yeah. So is that what got him into you? Or is that yeah, yeah, that's what got him in. And he, uh, and it was interesting because it kind of comes back to the emotional toxicity. We got him completely off prednisone and everything else. He was playing tennis again. He was doing great. And, but then he relapsed, but the relapse happened um, and it was basically emotional toxicity. He'd had, um, he'd been fired from his job and I mean, a lot of people get fired from their jobs and they don't get horribly sick by it, but for him, the whole constellation of his father and the way he'd grown up and his childhood milieu, and it just reactivated all of that stuff in him. So did you do his father on it? Yeah, okay. yeah, but to the extent that we could. Yeah. I mean, he, um, yeah, he engaged. And he's, he, you know, headed the other way now in, in that, but I'm just... Um, Oh, and you know, I've had a couple of people write to me out of the blue. Chris Ann was one of them for a friend of hers that has something really bad. And I've mm -hmm. sent them to Michelle Schrader. Right. And uh, so that's somebody that she can now teach all the classes and... Um, and do work with people if they want to. And do work yeah. with people. So we have Damon and somebody else we can uh, well, and, recommend. Well, and, uh, you know, and you don't need to be a professional to just ask a few questions. questions right. You know, I mean, that's... Just that, that whole thing with emotional toxicity, it, when I bring it up in a session, it isn't that I have extensive, I mean, I've worked a lot with Gilbert, but the thing, the thing that's unique is that I even bother to ask, you know, that I even bother to ask what's going on in your life, you know, and, and if they say something, you know, that they lost their job and that was what triggered this relapse, 
you know, immediately, you know, you're talking about, you know, probably re relationships with boss and authority and things like that. So you ask this story, well, what was life like at home? What was your relationship with your father or your mother? And, and this whole story just comes pouring out. Um, you don't have to know much to just ask a few questions. And then, and people are just so grateful that somebody even wants to hear their story. I mean, sharing, mm -hmm. sharing your story is, is huge and we don't really have anybody, often have, don't have people that really want to take the time to just listen to it. So you don't need to be a professional to do that. But, um, so I just wanted to say that this, um, you do want to do this diligently. And the, the, the last thing I want to say just about the science, just in, in general, there's, um, when we talk about immune reactions, um, medicine classifies them as type 1, 2, 3, and 4. I know that doesn't seem very sophisticated, but that's the way they classify them, type 1, 2, 3, and 4. So type 1 and 2 are reactions that would be obvious to anybody. So something like an anaphylactic reaction is a type 1 reaction. You eat some peanuts, everything swells up to the point you can't even breathe, you end up in the emergency room if you don't die before you get there. Um, you know, so that, that kind of very, very severe, obvious, dramatic allergic reaction. You know, that's type 1, type 2 is a little less. <laughs> type 3 and 4, um, these are what are referred to as serum sickness. Actually, the language has changed a little, but I like that because that's very descriptive, meaning you're having a reaction, but it's not really apparent. If you do blood tests, you find inflammatory markers, you find evidence of inflammation. Mm -hmm. It's corrosive. It's having an effect on your health. It's, it's bad. But you don't have the, the flaming, florid reaction like you'd see in a, an anaphylactic reaction. But it's just as damaging over time. So these, and a lot of these reactions that we have because of foods are these serum sickness reactions. We end up with antibodies and eventually, yeah. Um, concerning the villi that uh, the gluten can destroy. In celiac disease. Celiac disease. Yeah. Or whatever else uh, might uh, be harmful to the villi. Will they grow back? Oh yeah. They do grow back. Oh yeah. But the thing, but the thing is, is that, that um, let me just say a little more about that. There's this uh, confusion that a lot of doctors have that if you don't have celiac disease, then you don't have a problem with wheat or gluten. Right. And so, and that's just, it misses the point in so many ways. One of the reasons it misses the point, um, what do you think the incidence of true celiac disease is? What percentage of the population has it? One. One percent. Yeah. Yeah, one in a hundred. Okay. Really? So. Yeah, that, but that's a lot, one in a hundred. That's a lot, you know somebody. If you know a hundred people, you know somebody with celiac disease. So say, you know, the average doctor in primary care practice, you know, they might see over the course of their life, 10, 15, 20,000 people, depending on what kind of a practice they work in. Um, so how many cases would you expect them to see of celiac disease over the course of their practice? Well, 200. Two, maybe, maybe 200, maybe as many as 200. So how many primary care doctors who are in an active primary care practice, seeing lots and lots of people, um, how many primary care doctors have never made a single 